The best place to play fantasy football this summer is Underdog Fantasy. Their best ball media tournament has $10 million in total prize money. And the best part is if you draft your fantasy team, that's it. There's no waivers, no trades, no in-season management. Underdog gives you the best score each week of the season and the highest scores at the end of the year. The champion of best ball mania last year drafted in June. So there's no time like the present to join Underdog and take your shot at a million-dollar draft. Plus, Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to $100 when you sign up with promo code PFF. Also, if you play 10 of those dollars using promo code PFF, you get a free PFF subscription. So what are you waiting for? Head to underdogfantasy.com or the App Store. Play with $10, code PFF, and draft your best ball mania team today. Everybody. Coming at you a day later than usual after the long weekend. Um, going to have an interview also this week, so I was going to smash smash the episodes together a little bit. Uh, tight knit quarters, not that much of a gap between them. One will come out today on Tuesday, and then I'm doing an interview tomorrow with Ron Yurko. And for those who don't know Ron, he's a little bit of a more obscure name in the general football world, but he's pretty well known amongst the nerd set, especially the data set. He and another gentleman, I think it was Moscom Horowitz, but I'm not sure exactly what uh, if, if it was him or not. Um, they developed NFL Scraper, which was the first iteration of what Ben Baldwin and others have improved upon to become NFL faster, which is a lot of different data that you can get for free off of the NFL API. It had a calculation for publicly available information for an uh, expected points added calculation, a win probability calculation. He did a lot of research into trying to add a war-like number for player value. And for the last couple of years now, I think he's been working for zealous analytics which does work for a bunch of different sports including football so a lot of the stuff he's done is with tracking data so we're going to talk about that a lot and he is leaving zealous he's going to go and teach back at carnegie mellon where he got his master's and actually i'm sure did he get his phd he might have got his phd too i should probably check these things before i start talking about it too much but anyway i'll go over all that in the intro for the next episode we'll talk to ron and dig specifically into a lot of the tracking data insights, how valuable it is or not, and what he's seeing for a company that deals with and consults for a lot of NFL franchises. And he's also a guy who knows a lot about hockey and knows a lot about baseball. So I think there's like a shortcut way if you're analyzing a sport like football that hasn't dealt as much with the tracking data, that hasn't dealt as much with some of the higher level analytics as you've seen go through uh, baseball and go through basketball and go through hockey to some degree before. And then you can apply that and adjust it for football and get some insights pretty quickly, already having iterated through what works and what doesn't work. So anyway, Ron, talk to him tomorrow, publish that out on Wednesday in the afternoon. I hope you guys appreciate that. I'll have lots more interviews coming this summer. So what are we going to talk about? for what's happened recently. We're a little bit of a dead zone here for the NFL, but we did have a transaction that I want to talk about because it is David Njoku's extension uh, for the Browns. And the reason I want to talk about it is I think there are a lot of questions out there about whether or not this was a good deal. And when I say questions about that, it's mostly a lot of people saying that they don't think it was a good deal, who are maybe contract expert types. And then it is a decent amount of pushback, especially from Browns fans and fandom, quite a few of whom I, I, I follow. And I think I get both sides of this. So I'm going to try to bridge the gap a little bit here between those two different sides and give you my perspective on 
not only this Njoku contract, which let me give you the details, the parameters here, four years, 56.75 million, 28 million guaranteed. So it's an average annual salary of 14 point two million a year and if we look at the uh biggest contracts that we have um for the position i think this is when it comes down to when when some people are are pushing back against it is it just looks a little expensive versus what we've seen for other contracts at the position i believe he's on the fourth highest now in um annual value for Njoku. And we're talking about a player here throughout his career who doesn't have a lot of doesn't have a lot of production. He was a first round pick. They did give him, you know, the fifth year option and he played okay on it. Um, but we're talking about a player here who now threw five years in his career, and he had some injuries, not a lot of injuries, but he did have one season that was mostly wiped out due to injury. Throughout five years in his career, he has fewer than 1,800 pass, I mean, receiving yards in his career. He has fewer than 150 total catches throughout five years. So again, not even averaging 30 a season. And then he has 15 touchdowns, so about three a season. These are pretty pedestrian type of numbers. And, the, you know, they brought in Austin Hooper a couple of years ago in order to bolster the tight end room, even though they had Njoku there. And I think what's even a little bit more troubling for Njoku is that if we look at his career game logs, because sometimes what you can say is, you know, he's a really efficient player. That's what we've seen as part of the pushback here is that per target numbers, per reception numbers, he looks pretty good. He has very strong numbers that we've seen there. Let me let me see if I can pull up the exact numbers that I'm thinking of. Um, I think it was Warren Sharp who may have had something on Njoku's um, ranks. Here we go. So this is what some Browns fans are going to be pointing to. So he's second in EPA per attempt, which I assume means per target. Uh, second in yards after catch per reception fourth in yards per reception, and then 16th in catch rate. 16th is probably not that important to have here. All were career highs. This is all in 2021. The volume wasn't there. The efficiency was. Well, I mean, the problem is for we're talking about receivers is I think it's a pretty common mistake to lean a little too heavily on efficiency versus volume. I mean, part of the value is getting open and getting targets. And I know there can be bias in an offensive system in a quarterback who they are throwing it to. But for the most part, coaches through watching film, quarterbacks through their comfortability and faith that they have in different receivers will start to, on a team basis, allocate the targets appropriately. For instance, I was watching something just actually I was listening to something where uh Justin Herbert was being interviewed by the Ringer NFL pod the other day and when they're asking about how he goes through his progressions he says yeah he likes to get through his prog progressions quickly but at the same time he knows for certain receivers and Keenan Allen is the name that he mentioned that if he sticks with them a little bit longer he'll get open he has faith that he'll get open so Quarterbacks start to do that. They start to adjust on that. Coaches will start to adjust on how they how they develop their progressions based upon the personnel that they have. So if you're not getting targets, that in and of itself is a negative. Volume is valuable when it comes to the NFL because every time that you have to pass by someone on a progression is additional time in the pocket, which can lead to sacks, which can lead to strip strip sacks, highly negative plays there. It is time away from looking at another option in the offense who could be open, who could end up in a positive game. So there are negatives to just being out there running around and not getting targeted. There are negatives to that in your game. Uh, and defenses, of course, are going to game plan around the players who are being targeted much more than the players who aren't, who aren't being targeted. 
So I think a problem with Njoku is sometimes when you read these numbers and you say you have poor numbers overall, you can still get a little bit excited about a player because of the fact that they've been injured a lot. They hadn't run a lot of routes, so they didn't have that even ability to be on the field as a ceiling. And But there are lots of instances that you can point to in their careers and say, we have a bunch of really high-end games that this player has had. He just hasn't put it together on a consistent basis. So we're looking at Njoku here, go through all the different games that he's played now. So what are we looking at? 65 different games in the regular season that he's played now. He has one game where he got seven catches for 149 yards here in the 2021 season. So he has that game. You scroll through all these other regular season games. we got zero other games with 100 yards receiving. In fact, I don't think there is a single game here with, well, there's only one game with more than 75 yards receiving. That's 76 yards that he had in week one of last year. So you don't really have much even in that 75 to 80 range. We have lots and lots of games here of 10 yards, 20 yards, 30 yards, fewer than 50 yards. And if you look at what he's done, you know, in the playoffs, he's he had 59 yards in the last game against the Kansas City Chiefs, and he had seven yards before that. So there, it's definitely a projection. And I think that's going to go to my larger point about the Browns here. We've seen a lot of moves that they've made, which... If you look at things like the efficiency for Njoku, if you look at things like the age for Njoku, I mean, he is about getting close to turning 26, but he's not even 26 having played through his fifth year option already. So he's a young player. So it's a signing that is projecting what he's going to be able to do into the future. And the issue with that is projections can end up being right. You can end up getting value on guys if you project them correctly. But the chance to get excess value on top of that. So in other words, the chance that your contract that you're giving them is projecting this big leap for what they're going to do. The chance that they not only make that leap, but then they exceed that leap, which is going to give you extra value on this contract, is going to be small, is going to be smaller. Now, we've seen other poor contracts for some tight ends, uh, but even guys like Jonu Smith, who didn't do so well uh, on his contract, he is someone who had produced better, at least, in the past. And the other tight ends that we're talking about who are making more money than Njoku are Travis Kelsey, George Kittle, Dallas Goddard. Now, you could say Goddard isn't exactly didn't exactly tear things up before he had Zach Ertz there. But, I mean, when Zach Ertz was there. But, again, he was playing behind Ertz, who was a pretty talented guy, or playing with Ertz is a pretty talented guy. And he definitely did step up this last season, and then Mark Andrews, who's been one of the best tight ends in the NFL for ever since he came into the NFL. I mean, even Goddard had 830 yards last season, and he had previous seasons of 524, 607, so just better numbers than we've seen from Njoku, even while he was developing a little bit more and playing not out on the field quite as much. So, I think this goes down to the larger philosophy and maybe some issues I have with that when it comes to the Browns is that none of these, none of these transactions that they've made over the years have been debilitating or awful, I would say. And it was classified as being awful, this Njoku trade by some, I mean, Njoku's extension by some in and of themselves, but each one is giving you a higher probability of an incremental loss of value than your probability of gaining a little bit. That's what you want to do with these transaction transaction for me. Each decision is how can we shift the range of outcomes so that we're most likely going to gain at least some value on this transaction, but we also give ourselves a, a home run type of hit here. I think with these transactions, like this one with Njoku making a top five tight end, you're giving yourself 
less of a chance of gaining a little bit of value, less of a chance of really having a home run because of that number on there. But part of the larger Browns philosophy has been to do that over and over again. So each one of these transactions, I think, is been justified on an individual basis as saying it's not egregious, but probably not great. But then you start to add them all up and you wonder about it. I mean, Austin Hooper himself was made a top three or four tight end when he signed his contract with the Browns. Now the Browns had to cut him uh, post June 1st and take a decent cap hit based upon that cut. So that happened. Uh, Jack Conklin, I actually think that was a pretty good contract that they brought in. And I'm just going to restrict this to the Andrew Barry front office here. So Conklin, they brought him in there, but they did have to restructure it. And now, you know, he's at a pretty low number. And the, the injury concerns were baked into the number that you're bringing in for a tackle. So they were able to get him uh, at a decent number. So I, I'm okay with that one. I thought that was a good risk reward type of sign. So they had Conklin come in. Now, after that, they extend Kareem Hunt. I didn't think it was that bad. It was a pretty small number. But again, like extending running backs and even a decent number is just not somewhere you're going to get a ton of value. You're not going to hit a home run on a contract like that. And you're probably going to get a little bit of incremental loss on a deal like that versus a game. They bring in Troy Hill and John Johnson in free agency with pretty big contracts. I think they're good. They were, it was a good shot to say we want to compete this year and we're building out this team and it's almost knowingly giving away a little bit of a value in free agency to sign these big deals you're always going to do that with big deals but for the most part I don't know how well they've, they've worked out I mean Johnson's been okay uh, Hill is already gone they already they already uh, let him go so those signings again you're not giving yourself a lot of room there the Nick Chubb extension Chubb's a hell of a running back home run hitter not paying him debilitating type of guaranteed money and cap hit type of money as the Ezekiel Elliott contract. So it fell into more of that second tier of contracts that we've seen for Derrick Henry and Dalvin Cook and others. Um, again, not debilitating, but not likely to necessarily get you a lot of value. And then Denzel Ward earlier this year, another bit of a projection contract. He fits not the Njoku mold because... He's a much higher level player. He's played like a much higher level player, but he has been like a top 10, maybe borderline top five sort of guy as a cornerback. He's a young guy, again, that you could project to take another step forward, but you're giving him the contract, which at the time was the biggest contract in the NFL, which has now been exceeded by Jair Alexander. So he needs to project to go forward to be have his ranking as a cornerback match what his contract ranking is going to be. So difficult to get a lot of value on that. And we're seeing this again and again and again. But the Browns aren't in an awful situation as far as their cap is concerned. They have $25 million in cap space right now. So you could say, well, yeah, they're giving away a little bit, but they have this breathing room. And I think what's happened is this: they had such a huge store of value from the Sashi Brown years from the 2016 clearing of the decks, accumulating a ton of cap space, accumulating all these draft picks that they were able to make a ton of early picks, get valuable, get values on those contracts, not spend a lot of money, roll cap space over all this cap space over year after year, miss on picks, have it not matter as much because you had additional picks to go forward and build up this team, which was became a playoff caliber team last season, well, 2020, not 2021, I'm talking about here, with poor quarterback play because of what you were able to build around it and a lot of a lot of good moves there. And the problem is now we've reached the, the cycle, the point in the cycle where, yes, you have this $25 million in cap space that you can point to for the Browns. But when you look at what, how this contract contracts are going to evolve on the roster over the next year and how the talent is going to evolve. They're not all in on this season, but they're in a very advantageous place in this season here in 2022 versus where they're going to be in future seasons when you look at how a lot of these contracts are structured. And this is just another example with Njoku where you're saying, you know what, we're just going to pay the guy to bring him back. We're going to structure it in a way that 
is lower now and it'll bump up into the in the future and we're just going to continue same with ward same with chubb same with miles garrett same with the restructure of amari cooper same with wyatt teller same with uh joel Bent, uh, betonio same with john johnson same with deshaun watson all these guys all these guys contracts if you look at what they're going to do with their 2022 cap hit to their 2023 cap hit we're talking about a combined 140 150 million higher next season for the same players so yeah you have 25 million dollar in cap space yes the cap is going up yes you're gonna not have baker mayfield's 18 million on the books next year but we're talking about a huge jump year over year that's why this watson decision and how many games he's going to lose this year is really critical because this browns team is in a sneakily in a way which is weird is after making one of the biggest trades in nfl history for the amount that they gave up but because of watson's very questionable behavior and the and the circumstances for through how he got here i think it's being a little bit underplayed you know that this guy watson was like arguably the second best young quarterback in the NFL before he took off last season. And now guys like Herbert and Allen have continued to move up. You know, he was playing really, really on that level. And they're going to have him this year on a $10 million cap hit. They're going to have Miles Garrett at $13 million cap hit, which will then become 29. They're going to have Nick Chubb at 5 million, which will become 14 million. They're going to have Denzel Ward at 5 million, which will step up to 12 and then 23 million. Amari Cooper, 5 million to 23 million. Wyatt Teller, 4 million to 15 million. Uh, Joel Bitonio, six million to fifteen million. John Johnson, eight million to fourteen million. Jack Conklin, last year he's going to have six million of void year dead cap next year. Uh, Clowney, I believe his contract is structured with six million in dead cap next year. So you have this high high end quarterback play coming in. You have the best accumulation of talent that you're probably going to have going forward without the first round picks. You know, no first round pick. This year, no first round pick the next couple of years with the, with the Watson deal. They're a little bit more all in on this 2022 season than some people are probably appreciating there because they're not being talked about as a Super Bowl contender in the same way as the Bills and others. But they're really there. So this decision on this Watson uh, suspension is going to be huge for them. I mean, if Watson gets suspended for eight games and Jacoby Brissett has to play there for eight games, it could really impale, uh, impair their season if they can't make it to the playoffs because of, like again, how all of these contracts are structured. And not having those first-round picks, I mean, think about the, the important key players that we have as part of this Browns team, Garrett, Ward, Wills, Njoku, even Nick Chubb was an early second round pick. I mean, a lot of early, early picks that you're not going to have again for a few years. You're not going to have building back into the pipeline. You're not going to have that surplus value of contracts there. So big picture, uh, you know, again, Njoku is not an awful signing, I wouldn't say. It's not the worst signing. It's not something, it's probably something they can get out of, but it just it's again and again a team where you think of maybe an analytics franchise, an analytics front office as operating on being a little stingy with players, being a little bit searching for value too much, and then giving up the opportunity to push your chips in and go for it when the time comes. Um, I kind of think the pushing your chips in and going for when the time comes philosophy is a little overvalued because of the long tail that we have on a great quarterback if you have a great quarterback and your ability to compete over multiple cycles you don't necessarily want to go up and down too much i mean the patriots never went for an all-in type of philosophy there they were always willing to let players go and to rebuild the cupboards there um it's concerning for me but again it's not going to be something that's going to show up in 2022 you know, they're going to give themselves a, a great chance to win in 2022, probably the best chance they're going to have to win in a while, uh, because at the very least, you're going to not having Conklin or Clowney there next year. Maybe you can bring one of them back. We're going to be talking about more and more restructuring, which will eventually come due. Now, when you have a great quarterback, you can do a lot of that. But is, you know, Watson's cap number is going to go from 10 million to 54 million over the next four years, 54 million per year over the next four years. That's just going to take away a lot of flexibility that you're going to have around a lot of these deals. And the Browns really need to come through this year. This is a make or break 
maybe not break, but this is definitely a make year for Stefanski, for Andrew Barry. Presuming that Watson is able to play at least, you know, half, three quarters of the season this year to make things happen and go for it this season. But for the Browns, I'd have to say I am concerned about the series of moves here. It could work out. It could always work out in the short term. It's definitely helping their chances of winning in the short term. But as far as sustaining things, that's what I look for a little bit more in a franchise. And I don't know if we're necessarily going to see that from them when we start to get two, three, four years down the road. All right, let's hit a little ad time here. Manscaped. Gentlemen, Father's Day is just around the corner. The Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 includes their signature Lawnmower 4.0 and is the perfect bundle to tackle any and all old man hair. You got old man hair? I don't know if I have that much of it. I'm an old man. I don't have that much old man hair from head to toe. This right here is no dad joke. Treat yourself and join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer. Get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. And that is using code PFF. All right. So the next uh, section we're going to do here, and I think I've done this before here, where it's, I called it, uh, where in keeping it real goes wrong. I'm uh, leaning on Chappelle's show again here, but talking about keeping it real goes wrong from an analytical perspective. When you keep it Okay, so this is a, I'm going to hit a tweet here by Aaron Schatz. Of course, I, again, I'll do my caveats. I, I like Aaron, good guy, this and that. But I thought it was an interesting concept that he that he put out here that we can expand upon to talk about how you can kind, you can kind of go wrong, at least in framing, when we rely too much upon smaller sample data, which is highly influenced by situation and by selection bias in a lot of circumstances. A lot of differences are just nothing but selection bias and maybe not as much significance as we're building into it. So here's here's Schatz's uh, tweet here. He says, fun stat. Do you want to see who led the NFL in passes batted at the line last year? Josh Allen, and he said Josh Allen is 6'5", Justin Herbert, who is 6'6", and Ben Roethlisberger, who is 6'5", in that order. Passes batted down have nothing to do with QB height. Now, if you would have cut off that last sentence, it could have been a, hmm, this is an interesting sort of coincidence that the three tall, three of the tallest quarterbacks in the NFL, uh, they might rank up there with the, with, with the tallest as far as starting quarterbacks. I mean, 6'5", and a lot of, not many guys are taller than 6'5", and the shortest here are 6'5", and then Herbert is 6'6". Was isn't it interesting that the tallest quarterbacks in the NFL have the most batted passes without throwing in the passes batted down have nothing to do with quarterback height issue? Because he then expands upon it a little bit, looking at the rate stat of it versus others. And again, you still have a lot of tall guys in there, but then you start to bring in some shorter guys. Because I think what we're doing here is you don't want to look, you don't want to have the, uh, what should we say? The bowing at the altar of stats versus logic versus physics in some circumstances to build too much into this. And I've seen this done before. Um, even when we talk about some, some like running quarterbacks about how like running quarterbacks, it's not going to hurt. It's not going to make you get injured running the ball because these running quarterbacks haven't gotten injured as much um, or smaller quarterbacks, like being small doesn't mean you're going to, has nothing to do with getting injured or, or taking hits as a quarterback. And I think there, there has to be a little bit more account for just the pure logic of it. And then recognizing that there is a selection bias issue. So what's selection bias? Selection bias means we're not comparing equal samples when we're talking about here. So the, how, how would it work with this quarterback height example? First of all, let's think about the logic of it. If you are throwing the ball, your release point, where your arm's up in the air, where you're throwing the ball, that's point A. And then point B is where the ball is targeted when it gets to the wide receiver, where you want the ball to end up. And if you draw a line 
from point A to point B, which line is going to be for the equivalent throw, for the same exact throw, which line is going to be higher off of the ground? Is it going to be the line coming from Russell Wilson's hand to the same receiver as it's coming from Justin Herbert's hand? No, it's going to be lower. It's going to be much lower with Russell Wilson. The angle is going to be different. And especially the angle at the line of scrimmage, if you're taking a short drop, you can't really throw the ball over the top of the line of scrimmage as we see tall quarterbacks attempt to do quite a bit. It's just impossible. There's no way that whether or not that same exact pass has nothing to do with quarterback height. It has a lot to do with quarterback height. Your chances of having the same exact pass batted down if you're 6'6", and you're extending your arm above your head in the similar way to a quarterback like Russell Wilson, who is 5'10", and is doing the same thing in an 8-inch differential in height. With wingspan, it could be even 9 or 10 inches when we talk about where the ball is up in the air. There's just very little chance that that has nothing to do with quarterback height in that situation. Now, this is when the selection bias comes into play. Tall quarterbacks like Herbert or Ben Roethlisberger or maybe even Josh Allen they know they're tall. They can see over the top of the defense. They can see these short over the middle type of throws and they feel confident where they don't have to wait and hold the ball for a big window between offensive linemen. They feel more confident that I can just sling the thing over the top of these guys. Whereas Russell Wilson notoriously does not throw to the middle of the field. Uh, other guys like Kyler Murray and others who don't have a lot of batted passes necessarily do not throw to the middle of the field because they can't see the throw and they know they can't get it through there. They know they can't get it over the top. And when you're not even attempting to throw the ball over the top of defenders, how are they going to bat down the ball? You can't bat down the ball if you're not attempting to throw over the top of someone. That's where you get batted passes. So... That is a selection bias here, is that you're not getting the same sample of throws from Russell Wilson, from Kyler Murray, from Baker Mayfield, maybe, although Baker Mayfield, I, I feel like he does throw a lot of bad passes. You're not getting the same sample from those guys as you're getting from, from the others. So I get the idea that, and I think we've had this as part of a quarterback height discussion problems with this. I get the idea that we haven't seen it show up in the data, so we shouldn't worry about it. But there are negatives to what's going on. Again, you have to hold the ball a little bit longer if you can't throw it over the top. You have to adjust and move in the pocket where you may not have the room to do that. You might take more sacks because of that. You have to roll out much more often in order to throw these passes where they're not going to get batted, which can end up being good or bad depending upon the situation. It limits your playbook a little bit more by what you can do. And all of those things are negatives that go into it. So we can't just say quarterback height doesn't isn't a negative because we don't see the, the, the pass is batted or that the pass is bad and don't have anything to do with quarterback height because the selection bias is so different. And again, this is just something we see a lot in football data where logically we know something is happening. We know it's happening. We know that, again, when I'm talking about running quarterbacks, we know if you are... If you weigh 240 pounds versus you weigh 180 pounds, if you take the same hit, you're going to be hurt more often if you're the 180-pound guy than the 240-pound guy. Now, the 240-pound guy might, might try to take bigger hits versus the 180-pound guy might be better at sliding. But it's not that it doesn't matter or it's not that it's worse for your probability of getting injured all else being equal. If quarterbacks play in the same way, there are benefits to running guys over sometimes where you're going to get that from a bigger quarterback that you're not going to get from a smaller quarterback. And even then, we've seen Kyler Murray get injured recently. Uh, we've seen Lamar Jackson get injured. We've seen more injuries to this kind of small sample running quarterback type that we haven't seen in the past. So I guess that would be my thing here. Let's not let data, small sample data, data that's heavily influenced by selection and by sample and by the types of throws or runs that you're making. Let's not let that overwhelm just pure logic and i feel like in this case we did let it overrun logic a lot of people that were running with this sort of thing and making conclusions beyond what we could really say was true when keeping it real goes wrong 
Okay, now before we get to my next uh, section here, I'm just going to quickly mention PFF, 25% off any subscription if you use promo code UNEXPECTED. So you get all the locked article content, all the off-season content, fantasy football, tons of stuff about that and about best ball. We're having lots of improvement to the product there too. Data, grades, everything else you need for your off-season to get ready for the year. That is 25% off with promo code UNEXPECTED. All right, we're going to go back to a segment that I've had before where it was canceling a particular person because of a non-analytical take. But instead, you know, I'm just going to move it, the your canceled segment, to just talk about people who had some tweets out there that just got, <laughs> that they got killed for and got canceled for, or probably should have been canceled for. So there was a little bit more of a wrinkle on this, less, uh, no sticking to sports here, uh, as we go into the your canceled segment. Okay, so in the in the history of football guys, oh, in the history of football guys getting canceled, uh, this has got to rank right up there, right up there, and maybe the most egregious cancellation slash ratio I've ever seen in my in my entire life. Um, it's funny, I was actually uh, following this guy, although I don't know if I really see a lot of what, what he puts out there. And we're both following each other. Uh, Jonah Tolls. For those of you who did not see this, uh, let me see here. Previously, Draft Network, USA Today, uh, NFL Draft, Cowboys in Texas Tech, former reporter. Uh, I don't really know much about the guy. Religious dude, clearly. Um, he had one of the most ratioed tweets I think I've ever seen. So let me just, let me, let me give you some of the numbers, some of the stats here first. So this was on May 27th, so it was four days ago. And I think the, the new ratio, which, you know, used to look at replies as being a big thing. I'm sure this has a shit ton of replies on here, too, that are yelling at him. But I think the new ratio is the quote tweets to retweets, because that's when people really get in their business. So this this tweet has 143 retweets, which... They're like, who are these retweet people? <laughs> so 143 retweets, 4,287 quote tweets of all different varieties. I saw many of them in my timeline. And here's 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 what we're happening here. Obviously, uh, it's kind of like making a jokey type of segment on this, but it's a serious topic. And I want to make sure we're talking about that, obviously, with the shootings that have gone on recently, uh, whether it's in Buffalo or whether it's at Robb Elementary School in Texas. So here, his is two cents with the, you know, actually the, the, the emoji that looks like praying. I, that's actually a high five emoji. Did you know that? But it's been translated. But it kind of looks like praying. So people use it as praying. Uh, so two cents with the little prayer emoji there. And then a screenshotted notes app. Not sure why we did the screenshotted notes app, because I think this would actually fit in the 280 characters. But anyway, his his message here. This country needs more fathers and to not normalize divorce. The one stat you can directly correlate to criminals, question mark, whether they grew up in a broken home. The answer isn't more gun control. It's marriage control. Marriage is a covenant. Finn. I like Finn on the end there. It's very Italian film reference. Um, as you can imagine, people were not happy about this one. Um, and they were so not happy about this one that, uh, Jonah had to end up locking his account after this, but he kept the tweet up. So, and he even doubled down on it. He, he brought in, uh, Matthew 532 quote tweeted himself, standing up for the sanctity of marriage is deeply unpopular in today's culture. And it's very sad. Um, so, the, so keeping it up and then doubling down it's, it's pretty hardcore. Uh, uh, I don't know if you give credit for that because it's like doubling down a bad take probably shouldn't get credit for it. But, um, and I do like the stats being brought into this because I don't, I don't get that really at all. Like, well, what stats are we directly cor correlating here? Um, like, 
it's just why are you shoehorning your your marriage take into this whole situation? So this dude was getting crushed. Absolutely crushed. One of the worst I've ever seen. And then it follows it up by saying, over the last 24 hours, I've received vile messages of wishing me to get divorced, doxing and death threats over my beliefs. It's just evil to see some going after my family. Love you all regardless of opinion. Praise the Lord for taking my deserved place on the cross. Yeah, that one was not as well received. And then afterwards, he says, I've decided to take my page private for the foreseeable future to the doxing and threats that are continuing. I understand what I stand for may be controversial, but please understand that the that the reaction has put myself and my family at risk. I mean, number one, like I didn't quote tweet this guy, although I am giving this oxygen here in the podcast, and so maybe I shouldn't. Um, it's a little less viral, a little less of a viral spreading nature here on the podcast, so I feel okay talking about it. You know, I didn't quote tweet the guy. Like, if you think the guy's an idiot, I don't have a need to be to tell people that I think this guy's an idiot. Um, I remember the great Bomani Jones once said about Twitter, a perfect quote about Twitter, that Twitter is about you're either when you're on Twitter, you're either going to you're either trying to inform or perform. So like sending out dunking on people for these sorts of things, you're not informing anyone, I don't think, in your in your timeline. Clearly, you disagree with the person, everyone that you're sending it out to, you're disagreeing with it. You're more performing performing rage on some of these sorts of sorts of things. So I, I don't like to do that. Although I like, again, I am talking about here, but I don't like to do that. So I, you know, I feel bad a little bit for the guy getting, getting crushed on here. At the same time, I'm always a little bit skeptical of people who talk about doxing because doxing, like it has no meaning now. Like it used to mean you're posting someone's address or something like that. And people are co- really coming after you. Now it just means the smallest things. But I do think, you know, if you're trying to get the guy fired or whatever, it's probably not not a good thing to do. Um, and I would say, you know, some people probably could detach a little bit from what's going on in Twitter. I realize maybe your parents are divorced and you're upset by seeing this. Like some people were, it's, it's upsetting no matter what. Um, you know, you, you don't have to tweet about it. But I think the biggest thing is like, is, is, this, guy's, is this guy's behavior actually going to be changed going forward? Uh, because of the fact that he got colossally dunked on and piled on this. Probably not, but he has gone private. So if people feel like that in itself is a victory, I mean, I, I guess I'll give it to you. But I don't really I don't really care about that sort of thing. But just the egregiousness of the cancellation here had to be talked about. I, I couldn't I couldn't let this one go. And maybe I'll talk about some other serious cancellations in the future. But for now. Mr. Tolls, I'm sorry, you are canceled. Okay, let's get into the last thing here. We have a little bit of a mailbag here. I would suggest to people who want to put some questions on here for me to answer that you can do so. YouTube seems to be a pretty good way. I'm getting a lot of feedback from some of the YouTube videos. So if you have some more questions on things that are going on, go ahead and shoot me some stuff on YouTube. I had a uh, a lot of questions last week for here. Uh, First, I'm going to go with Mark mentioned uh, on the, uh, as a response to last week, where he's talking about his hypothesis. He says, speaking of the Ravens and analytics, do you think about the hypothesis? And this is, this is an interview that I did with uh, Sean Clement, who worked with the Ravens and worked with the analytical group, the research and development group for the Dolphins. So check that out from last week if you want to. So he says, what do you think about the hypothesis? Eric DaCosta, Eric DaCosta being the GM of the Baltimore Ravens, stated that tight end and safety are undervalued positions for their impact on the pass game. It looks like the Ravens are running the experiment this year of collecting excessive talent at these positions. But I am wondering what the analytical basis might be. I would also be really interested in the ungraded effect of how tight end wide backs and running quarterbacks add run pass optionality to the offense where coordinators can respond to defensive personnel with advantageous play calling. Okay, first let's get into tight ends and safeties. I mean, according to the war numbers that we have, the impact numbers, whether it comes to the coverage grade of a safety or the receiving grade of a tight end, yeah, they would be undervalued. and. The question all comes down to like replaceability versus value. So 
like you have a war value, which looks pretty good. You have an actual kind of like absolute value over replacement level type of player that looks pretty good. But how often is A, that a sticky season over season? Because we're talking about coverage grades when you're targeted, especially for safety. It's not something that's necessarily that consistent. And then how often can you find these guys in different areas? I mean, tight ends famously, I think, have been extreme values at the top for these positions because there are only five. Uh, everything kind of comes down to the franchise tag for me. Franchise tag just ends up being huge because it's like this huge leverage point for every contract is the threat of eventually going on the franchise tag is what sets the market in a lot of positions. So when you only have five players who go into the franchise tag calculation at certain positions, that is really the cream of the cream of the, of the crop. We're talking about um, tight end. I mean, not tight end. We're talking about uh, cornerbacks where you can have two, three on the field at any time. If we're talking about wide receivers where you have two, three, four on the field at any time. If we're talking about offensive linemen, you got a lot, you got at least two tackles, right, on the field at all times. If we're talking about uh, defensive linemen, you have the edge rushers, you have at least a couple on the field at all times. So when you're taking the top five of those positions, you're going to naturally get a higher amount. Now, when we go to tight end, the top five of that position, the most valuable guys in valuable in a receiving way, there just aren't that many to go around. So you're being dragged down by the talent level beyond the first couple of two. And most times in the NFL, like you had Gronk and, and Jimmy Graham were kind of the two guys. I know Jimmy Graham has become kind of a punchline in his later career, especially with, with the Bears. But at one point in time, it was like Gronk and Jimmy Graham. These guys were like borderline first line pick, first round picks in fantasy. And then he kind of just had everybody else. You had some guys who might rotate in and this and that. But, you know, those everybody else guys, three of them are going to be part of the franchise tag calculation, keeping that number down, using that for tight ends when you're negotiating, saying, hey, if we we can franchise tag you twice rather than sign you to a big deal, we're barely going to be paying anything. Why should we pay you a lot of money? So it moves up lower and lower. I mean, even we talked about the Njoku contract earlier about he's the fourth highest paid tight end. He's still 13 million a year, which is not that that high. So even right now, if you look at the best tight ends of the game, Kittle, Kelsey, and then you, you have a drop off, maybe Andrews and other guys fit into it. You're starting to get a little bit more of a collection of talent, but you're just not going to have those five guys to really build up the value. So there is a lot of contract value for tight ends, but you have to hit and get one of these big guys because they're never going to hit free agency. And those guys who have hit, Kittle, fifth round pick, Kelsey, third round pick, I believe, uh, Andrews, third round pick. These guys are not spending premium draft capital on them. So a lot of the times it's taking calculated shots on them, hoping you're going to get maybe the one or two tight ends, three tight ends who are really super values at that position. And you get, you have good leverage because of the, of the, of the franchise tag, but there just aren't a lot of huge talent out there. Luckily the Ravens have Andrews who's a pretty, pretty big guy there. Safety. Again, low franchise tag amount there, which helps negotiating these contracts. But there are lots of guys available on the market. Now, if they become, if it become more of a true too high everywhere system, bring in a third, a, a third safety, a lot of times like the Ravens may be doing, that can boost the value quite a bit, the relative value that you're getting out of a position which just doesn't cost that much. Now, do you need to use a first round pick on it like they did with Kyle Hamilton? I think that's really still the question that I'm not, all in in either way on. And for the second part of this question, talking about the optionality of these different offenses, I'm a little bit less, uh, I don't know. I'm a little, I, I believe in this a little bit less than maybe some others do. I know we see a lot of splits out there about, well, if you use 12 personnel, then you have this sort of efficiency versus 11 personnel, this sort of efficiency. So having that second tight end of using 12 personnel will give you a sort of boost. Again, I think we're suffering from selection bias, like I mentioned before on here, where on third and 10, especially if you're using traditional success rate metrics where you need a first down in that circumstance to be a successful play, you're just not going to run 12 personnel. You're not going to run play action out of 12 personnel on third and 10. So your success rates are going to be lower. And 
there's also selection bias in that teams that run more 12 personnel probably have better tight end personnel than some others do. And it's hard to get a couple of really great tight ends there. Uh, and when it comes also to the wide backs, so we're talking about maybe like a Debo Samuel of what we're talking about there. Yeah, I think teams probably should be doing that a lot more. But at the same time, wide receivers are expensive. They're expensive in draft capital. They're expensive in contracts. So would you want to be moving a more expensive player into a less expensive as far as the cost of replacing it with running back carries when you're lining up in the back? Because it seems like for Samuel, what he really did out of the backfield was not create mismatches and then passing opportunities, but he just had killer efficiency running the ball. So he's just running the ball as a wide receiver, not really as much of a displacement or taking advantage of a, of a defensive matchup as you might think. So I'm, I'm still skeptical, I would guess, on having all of these different optionality. I think if you can really know your personnel and drive the most value out of that, it becomes difficult to meet. You might eventually go up against a team that you know has your number as far as a matchup is concerned, but that's where I would lean more than some others. Okay, another question we had here was whether or not, uh, it says, curious on the data side of things, as more data becomes available, how are these streams of new data being standardized across multiple eyes? Their interpretation is you can create and start creating databases. How much noise do you see from grade to grade on film study that is there usually one set depending upon players and how do you kind of adjust for average grade? So I would say for the data streams, this is something I'm going to talk a lot with Ron Yurko about tomorrow when I interview him, because the newest real data stream that we're talking about is the tracking data. And I think they're just dumping it all on teams and other players where they're not really doing a lot of standardization prior to it or interpretation or uh, trying to give you an easy track towards getting insights. I think it's more up to the teams to take the data in. And we're talking about very large data sets here when it comes to tracking data, which is completely the opposite of what football and the small sample football data that we had in the past. Now, rather than getting a, a game where you have, you know, whatever it ends up being, I don't know, 150 plays during a game. Now we're talking about during those 150 plays, you're going to have 22 different players where you're going to have their X, Y coordinates every 10th of a second, or maybe it's even more often than that, their directionality and everything like that, where you're going to then be able to have to calculate the momentum, their speed, everything else that goes into all of these different numbers. You're just expanding you know, by a hundred thousand times the amount of data that you're having on this game. So the teams are able to store it effectively, be able to pull up on it and make quick analysis. I think that's a big thing. Data engineering, data storage is, should be a huge focus for a lot of these teams. Um, maybe the biggest focus right now for some of these teams before you can even think about being able to interpret it, to interpret what you're doing there. And grading standardization is an interesting question because we're working on that a lot now. I don't have the details of it, but I know Timo Risque and some others have been working on our grading just to make sure that it's a little bit more standardized. There are some issues sometimes where you'll look at a game grading for a particular player, and let's say they had a 75, a 79, and a 82, and then you look at their overall grade and it's 84. It's like, how does that happen? How do you have an 84 overall grade for the season based upon those three games when it's way off? So there, there are, we're working a little bit of higher level of being able to standardize that zero to 100 grading, be able to make adjustments, being able to correct for some of the things that I've mentioned, like sacks and others, which probably aren't being accounted for enough. So it's, it's a pretty detailed process. I don't, I don't know the details on that, unfortunately for, for, for you guys, but I just, you know, I'm very confident in what Timo's doing there and it's in his hands and he, sh he always does great work. So I'm excited, honestly, to see what he may have going forward. Uh, the last thing that I'll mention here is uh, put the place of analytics in a center. Okay, here we go. It says, is it possible for analytics to be used in a non-sporting fields, for example, hospital to figure out personnel rotation, scheduling of procedures, prescribing of meds, assuming it's already being done, but how can it be optimized in all these different fields? So yeah, it's being used much more in all these different fields. 
And the reason I want to talk about it, because I think everyone knows that analytics are a big part, business analytics are a big part of what, what businesses are doing out there and going forward, that it's being used almost everywhere. So why is there like this extra faith in the value of analytics in these outside fields versus in sports, especially football, it's so, there's so much skepticism about it. Why is that? Maybe measurability is a little bit easier. If you have standard things like revenue, you can do A-B testing, you can really test things out in, in a better sort of way on the outside than versus the inside. So, you know, I'll give a little bit of a leaning to the football guys and say, maybe that's the case, why they're not using as much. But I think the bigger thing is you get more feedback, faster feedback, continuous feedback, and more quantifiable feedback on the outside in these businesses. You know, you'll see immediately the, the top line or the bottom line start to move. You'll see immediately how you can decrease maybe your total outlay in salaries by figuring out better rotations. You'll see immediately in a hospital and other places what the, what the outcomes are of these patients that are constantly revolving in and out of the, the hospital, what the outcomes are and whether or not there's improvement. So getting that feedback, when you get that feedback consistently, quickly, in an interpretable way, you can more easily make the connection that yes, like what we're doing on the analytics side to determine a more thoughtful, better way of processing our resources in order for, to 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 um, to gain certain outcomes, you gain a lot of faith in that, and then you use it more and more. On the football side, it's very difficult. We're talking about fourth downs. You know, you may only have a couple dozen for the entire year that you're really considering going for and how those go or not, who knows? You know, you have game outcomes where you have a few things can be flipped by one score outcomes that happen during certain seasons. You have, you know, the number of plays, even in a particular game, you're only going to be able to influence through these changes in analytics a certain amount. So I think it's just not having that faith through not having that constant rotation and feedback of outcome is where sports has kind of fallen behind. And even if you don't have that, I think there has to be a little bit more faith on this side because of the impact that we've seen in all of these other areas, which has been strong, which has been significant, which has been somewhat revolutionary, depending upon what field that we are talking about. Okay, everybody, thanks for tuning in. We're about an hour here. Again, I'm going to interview Ron Yurko tomorrow. Leave me your comments, concerns, questions in the old YouTube uh, comments or go ahead and rate and review on iTunes and other places. Until then, I'll be talking at everyone later this week. Thanks so much.